Uh, now, I propose to tell some stories. I started with the first story. So we're going to turn to literature. We're going to turn to literature. Thomas Mann, 1900. The year is 19. He writes Putin books. Story of a family, the rise and fall of the family of Putin books. And uh, same year as Freud publishes the interpretation of dreams, right? I mean, life in, in old Vienna and in Hanseatic Germany. So, as I mentioned, um, <coughs> Just coincidentally, Thomas Budenbrooks, a successful businessman, gave up his artistic career in order to run the family business, in order to pay the rent. And uh, so he compensates by marrying his artistic career. Uh, bad joke. Uh, Gerda, she's playing passionate violin duos with her father. You know, she has to leave town. They re relocate. So now she's no longer living with her father. Uh, and they have a son. We'll come back to that. They have a son, Hanu. He is somewhat sickly. In Thomas Mann, he is small and artistic, of course. He has bad teeth. This is important. Uh, because he's going to go to the dentist. We're going to have a trip to the dentist. Get ready. This is 1900, ladies and gentlemen. Get ready. Okay, I mean, so he's sick. He gets. You know, his father is a hail fellow, well met type. He's compensated. He's, Thomas has well compensated. He's no longer like, you know, a sensitive artist. He's like the cheerful professional salesman. And he's something of a boot camp dad. Let's have your lessons, you know. Multiplication tables. But, you know, it's fairly standard in, in the gymnasium and in advanced prep schools, you know, let stand and deliver. I mean, did, build some character here, right? That's fine, you know, it's like nothing wrong with that. It doesn't work. It's not working very well with Han. He just comes apart. It's like tears, you know, he breaks down. He can't do, he knows 12 times 12 is 144. He's like, <laughs> right? And he wants to go to his room and have his stories and fantasies. So, meanwhile, he has bad teeth, which we can talk about the symbolic value of that. It, it's a recurring motif in Ma, in Thomas Ma. It's perhaps, here's the psychoanalytic moment, perhaps suggesting that he doesn't really, sort of oral, passive-aggressive, grasp the nipple of life and suck at it for all it's worth. He's really struggling with that. His teeth are kind of loose. They're bright, the enamel is good. But there are a lot of cats. So we're off to the there's Herr Brecht in Mann. The dentist is named Herr Brecht, which means broken. It's like broken, broken tooth. Happens to be a famous playwright as well. So poor Hanna ends up at the dentist's office. Here is the first, the moment of empathic receptivity. So I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote, you're going to listen. I think I have this quote in the deck somewhere, but just, just listen to it. Get ready. Example of empathic receptivity, page 403, 404, Budenbrooks, translated by Lowe Lo Porter. The bad thing about Dr. Brecht was he was nervous and dreaded the tortures he was obliged to inflict. We must proceed to extraction, he would say, growing pale. Hanno himself was in a pale, cold sweat with staring eyes, incapable of protesting or running away. In short, in much the same condition as a condemned criminal, he saw Herr Brecht with the forcept, his sleeves bending over him. He noticed that little beads were standing out on Brecht's bald brow and that his mouth was twisted. When it was all over and Hanno, pale and trembling, Spat blood into the blue basin at his side. Herr Brecht, too, had to sit down, wipe his forehead, and take a drink. This is not a quiz. What's going on here? Herr Brecht is suffering, right? I mean, he's suffering. Otto sweating. We don't go into the details, but dental work in those days was gruesome. Uh, and uh, he's like, the, the, so the joke, right? Bad joke. He should have gone into, 
optimum. I pause for one thing. He's, he's committed. So, so what he's experiencing emotional contagion. He's got emotional infection. Your description, the neurons are going off. His mouth is twisted, right? I mean, he's working in poor Hano's, getting in there. It's like, so that's. And his mouth is sweating, Hano's sweating, he's sweating. So this is the breakdown. This is a, it's a breakdown. And so what's the recommendation? Well, the record, in this instance, it's perhaps not as simple as one might wish. We're up against some, some predisposition. We're up against some biology. He may usefully change the narrative. He doesn't have a narrative. Right? He's, he doesn't appreciate the service. He doesn't appreciate what his contribution is. He needs to do a little work on what his contribution is to take some distance. The filter, the granularity of his experience is to why? He needs to contract the filter. He really does need to intellectualize. You, I mean, we're a bunch of, many of us, speaking personally, over-intellectualization is no favorite indoor sport. It's been known. People are educated, may tend to go there. It's, it's great. Keep doing it. There's nothing wrong with it as such. Nevertheless, so we constantly have to struggle against that. This is one example <coughs> where one may usefully do some work increasing the granularity, narrowing, contracting, constricting. So that's a breakdown in empathic receptivity. He's suffering too much. Strange as it may sound, he should suffer, but not too much. He should have a vicarious experience, so he's sensitive to, does this one hurt, or does this one hurt? Right? You write that down, it, on a good day, he gets it right. Which one, is, you know, then you give up, oh my God, that's the one. And then he's very careful with that one. So he has a vicarious experience. Uh, and so, okay, so moving right along. So I pause. Let's pause for breath. Questions about that? Comments? Not required, but... Okay, so we'll, move, we'll keep moving along, and, and we'll have just enough time. The next example is also in Thomas Mann. And remember, the uh, Gerda is playing passionate violin duos with her father. She moves away. She meets... The lieutenant. He plays the violin. They, there's Thomas has his home office in the back of the big house, and they're upstairs. Gerda and the lieutenant play duos on the violin. It's so, you know, all of a sudden the music stops. There's silence. The silence continues. The silence continues. The silence continues. It goes on like that for quite a while. Uh, here they are. Here's Gerda and the Lutens. He's not in his uniform. And she's demonstrating playing Kitsikani on the violin. Anyway, they're upstairs having, <coughs> do, having their violin session. And there's a long silence. Thomas is going nuts. What's going on? He doesn't want to be a caricature of the jealous husband. These are sophisticated people. Thank you very much. He's not going to barge in and be a car caricature of the, of the uh, jealous husband, whatever I said. It's the jealous husband that he did. And, uh, and so he's wandering the corridor. He's walking back and forth. Right? He doesn't know what to do. He's like sweating too, although it's his teeth are not being drilled. He's wandering back, and so he runs into Hana, who's expecting, you know, to be drilled on his mathematical tables or whatever he's being, his Latin declensions or verb forms. He, he's a, but, and they greet one another. You know, poor Hano's like miserable. This guy is getting, Hano, so here, I think I mentioned this, right? The, the, Nord, the Nordic strapling types tease him and beat him up at school. At home, you know, his father's like the boot camp dad, he'll go well mad, fuck up son, you know. Uh, and anyway, so he's intimidated, but the boy is intimidated. Uh, which brings us, so they run into, you know, there's still silence. Okay, so here's, the, here's an example, arguably, uh, but, but his father did not seem to be listening. He held Hano's free hand and played with it absently unconsciously fingering the slim fingers. And then Hano heard something that had nothing to do with his lessons at all. 
his father's voice in a tone he had never heard before, low, distressed, almost imploring. Ah, no, the lieutenant has been more than two hours with Mama. And what? Little Hanno opened wide his golden brown eyes at the sound. They looked as never before, clear, large, and loving, straight into his father's face with its red eyelids under the light brows, its white puffy cheeks, and long, stiff mustaches. God knows how much he understood, but one thing they both felt. In the long second when their eyes met, all constraint, coldness, and misunderstanding melted away. Hanno might fail his father in all that demanded vitality, energy, aliveness, and strength, but where fear and suffering were in question, there Thomas Budenbrooks could count on the trust and devotion of his son. On that common ground, they met as one. And one. So, their eyes meet. Ah, no, Mama has been with the lieutenant more than two hours. I've got no idea what this guy is talking about. He's eight years old, maybe nine, not very old. But he get, I mean, their eyes mean he gets something. Right? And so this is, there's, there is a moment of receptivity here inside the understanding. There's a possibility, and I hope this helps to motivate what empathic understanding is. What's the possibility? This is not a quiz. What's the empathic possibility? It's okay, you can shout it out. I mean, I have an answer. Yeah. And one possibility, consider the possibility, that the possibility is something like vulnerability. This is boot camp dad, hail fellow well met. Here, whatever Hano understands from nothing, uh, the symbolism of playing violin duos and the lieutenant and mama, you know, having a play date upstairs in the music room, right? I mean, this is like, you know, this is 1900. Right? Um, nevertheless, there's a vulnerability there. The possibility of dad, the father, being a mensch, being a human who's vulnerable. And, 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 and mom, of course, is author of fear and suffering. You know, that's a lot of that in little Hanno's life. And so uh, that in itself, I mean, that in itself is a powerful encounter. And ultimately, I mean, Hanno is, you know, his empathy are, is emerging, arguably. He's growing up. I mean, he's struggling with his own suffering and his different ways of expressing it. Thomas, I mean, is some, I mean, the, the breakdown. So what's the breakdown there? I mean, Thomas Budenbrooks continues to project the requirement that Hanno go into the family business. It's just not going to go well. We can't let go of that, and it's really bad. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, those are two good examples from the outside in. But I, I think I have a Dilbert here where, uh, so I'll just motor this is so bad. Uh, but there's a close relationship between empathy and humor. <coughs> And we're not going to do the exercise, but here is kind of the exercise. So, uh, you know, the pointy head boss says, now all teams will be formed on the basis of Myers-Briggs personality types. If you do not have a personality type, one will be, if you do not have a personality, one will be assigned to you by the human resources department. Then the devil says to the, the other guy, we need a quiet, dumb guy to pair with an extroverted thinker. Dada. This is a very serious group, I must say. Okay. Uh, and so, so here's the point. Categories. This is deeply cynical. It's funny. It's funny. I mean, and it is not recommended that you take this as a one basis approach. Right? Because of the cynicism gets in the way of the empathy. I mean, it's not to say that some of this is not a blog in the land. It is. It's good news, bad news, right? But in this, it demonstrates that denial, cynicism, fear, you know, people working here are going to be fearful. I'm going to get labeled and devalued. And that's actually the exercise we have to time. We distinguish that devalued. It's not going to go away. It's going to shrink. 
and distinguish it and then relate as human beings. Thank you for that. Well, it enables me to. And, and so, listen, we are at the top of the hour, possibly a few minutes over. I'm going to be around. I mean, I'm scheduled till, you know, whatever it is, one noon, 20 minutes after. I'm happy to engage one on one with Brother Kai. I wish to express my appreciation for your gracious listening. I got a lot of empathy. Mm -hmm. I hope, and likewise, I hope you all did too. Uh, feel free to get my card. I'd be happy to follow up as a conversation. I would like to say I am a resource to you. Here's the, the flagrant, I'm bringing it in for a landing here. I actually am teaching an open enrollment seven session class, Tuesday evenings, starting September 27th at the Graham School, that's the University of Chicago downtown, adult education. We're gonna look at some of this stuff. <coughs> you, know, you all are invited, once again, let me express my appreciation 